This is a story from New York, not the New York of Manhattan, the skyscrapers and Broadway, but from perhaps the toughest square mile in the city, in the South Bronx. It's a story from what they call the big house, the busiest firehouse in New York, America, and therefore perhaps the world. It's a story about danger and about frustration. A story of a remarkable group of men who belong to engine number 82, ladder number 31, and battalion 27 of the New York Fire Department. Sometimes parts of New York look more like a B feature film set than somewhere for people to live. Like the South Bronx, a backdrop to incessant drama for the firemen of Ladder 31 and Engine 82. The fire statistics for New York are staggering. New York has more fires than Chicago, Detroit, Los Angeles and Philadelphia put together. The New York Fire Department responds to nearly a quarter of a million calls a year, three times as many as the London Fire Brigade. And the busiest district is the South Bronx, where last year the men from Battalion 27 responded to more than 10,000 calls. On average, that's one every 45 minutes, night and day, every day of the year. Few would challenge their claim to be the busiest fire station in the world. Most of the fires they fight are in abandoned buildings. Many of them are started deliberately. All are dangerous. Okay, uh, yeah. I want to move back. Let's yeah. go up over here. Talk to an officer here about uh, controlling the uh, the kids on the apparatus, and he tells me it's a fireman's job. Now, when you're taking up, will you stop back at the what is it, the 42 precinct there and get that thing straightened out? Battalion 27, second call in 15 minutes to this building, the first to put out a smoldering mattress. The mattress fire whetted somebody's appetite for more fire, and uh, 15 minutes later, we're back here, and the, the building was just almost completely involved in fire. Anybody hurt at all or injured at all? Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, five men in Engine 82 are going to uh, go to the hospital just to take a, get a check, you know. But it's kind of exhausting when you, when you do two floors of fire like that, and you're working at, at, at peak capacity, physical capacity. Uh, and it's completely exhausting. You should get checked if you, if you have no more energy. You know. So and now, if you look around, you'll see all the men are just about depleted of whatever energy they had. And this was just for a fire which presumably started deliberately, was it? Oh yeah, obviously it was. It was. It was an arson. A case of arson. Right, so this is ridiculous. Now, I'm hey. supposed to be working. But Jesus, Mr. Christ, this looks like uh, 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 this is a hell of a. If we, we've uh, gotten anything across to them about safety, this isn't it. Okay, all right. Christ, I mean, this is a white pen. Two guys no, 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 scrubbing no, 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 the goddamn no, 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 ladder. All right. A routine fire in an abandoned tenement with no immediate danger to life or even property. Yet as a result of it, for the next hour and a half, the South Bronx was without effective cover. More than half the men of Engine 82 and Ladder 31 were sent to hospital for checkups, including fireman Dennis Smith. Uh, the captain and, and Vinnie and I just came back from the hospital. 
uh, were okay. They kept uh, uh, Benny Cassidy there and, and Jimmy Stark for, for x-rays. They had, uh, you know, kind of an um, inflammation of the chest or something. But we went to the hospital mostly because it's, when you went to heat and smoke like that, it does things to you, uh, to, to my eyes and to lots of people's eyes. And it inflames them to such that when you even blink, you know, it hurts. So you go to the hospital and they, they put a needle in the side and, and drain the whole thing out and put some saline solution. But is there a safe way of fighting a fire like that as compared to fighting a fire uh, when there is a hazard to life? No, I mean, technology hasn't, hasn't, hasn't shown us a safer way of, of fighting a fire except getting closer to it and putting water on it. time for fires is between three in the afternoon and midnight, between the time the children here come out of school and go to bed. On an average night, there may be several fires like this in abandoned or deserted buildings. All take their toll of manpower, and on this night, by 10 o'clock, only one of the original crew of six on Engine 82 was still fit to work. I'm an MPO, which means I'm a motor pump operator, and I had to deliver water to the fire. So I'm not permitted to go into the fire building in the event of a fire, my station is to stay with the engine uh, and make sure that they have the water, the proper water. So it could be said it was your lucky night. Well, I like to go into the fires. That's my job, and uh, that's what I uh, do the best, put out fires. Forty miles away from the Bronx in upstate New York, another world, the gentler, friendlier world of suburban America. Dennis Smith is a fireman extraordinary. He wrote a best-selling book called, simply, Report from Engine Company 82. Dennis sold the film rights for more than $100,000, even by American standards, a lot of money. <laughs> Dennis and his family, if not rich, wouldn't starve if he stopped risking his life fighting fires. But he hasn't stopped, has hardly even considered the possibility of stopping. Well, because I have a commitment to, to, to them both, to the institution called Fire Department, <clears throat> and to firemen, and to being a fireman, and, uh, and in this country, I think it's, it's quite a respectable profession. Uh, it's, it's certainly an interesting one. I mean, uh, and for any kind of creative thinker, there's a wide range of possibilities, future growth, you know, as, as a professional. But what are, the, what are the, the satisfactions you get out of being a fire? <clears throat> oh, they're all at, at the highest level of abstraction. You know, they've got to do with, with a, 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 some kind of a uh, Self-gratification, I guess, a tremendous sense of achievement, um, and um, a, a kind of an honor about the whole thing. I have heard it compared to bullfighting. Yeah, I guess because bullfighting, after all, comes from a Spanish tradition, and within the Spanish tradition is, is you know, this the whole concept of machismo and this, the, the need um, to to uh, prove virility, and uh, perhaps. Uh, Perhaps in that sense, you know, firefighters also are fulfilling a need. Because the work, as I, as I reflect on it as a journalist now, not as a fireman, um, it's, I mean, the concept of running into a building everybody else has run out of is insane. And, 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 and you know, for X number of dollars, for a lower middle class income, to do this kind of work and to brutalize bodies the way we necessarily do in the course of our work is also insane. But yet there's, you know, and it goes back to the courage thing. And Joseph Conrad wrote books about it, you know, this need to prove 
to prove that you can do it. And I guess that operates, too, among firemen. Have you ever wished that Dennis would give it up, give up firefighting? I began to wonder if, you know, is it worth it that you would be laid up like that just from wrenching your back, picking up a piece of hose, and, and it does get, you know, gets depressing, but uh, he's happy doing it. I mean, I, I'm, I have to resign myself to that. That's, that's the whole thing of it. I, uh, I, can't, I can't make myself miserable about it. I would rather him work in a school, you know, in town, and he's qualified to do that now, or to sit home and write books, you know, and be comfortable. But uh, I, that would be ideal for me, but it wouldn't be ideal for him. So Dennis Smith devotes his life to this district of New York, the richest city in the richest country in the world. The South Bronx used to be a respectable Jewish neighborhood. Then it was respectable Irish. Now it's a ghetto fast becoming derelict. It hasn't been bombed, it's been devastated by neglect and the people who live here, mostly immigrants from the Deep South or Puerto Rico. There are few parks, no playing fields or even play streets, so they improvise their own amusements, sometimes to the firemen, lethal. What they'll do is they'll cut a hole in the floor, say right by the entrance to the apartment. They'll cut a hole in the floor and they'll cover it over with some like a piece of cardboard or something like that. So when the fireman does go in and he's crawling in, he'll crawl, you know, and they'll go right through the hole. And what they'll do also is, uh, I knew what they were doing, it was they get the piano wire and they were stringing it right across the entrance to a doorway, about neck high. So when the fireman's crawling into the place, he'll crawl in and they'll I just felt with the piano wire. Well, another one they were yeah. doing was with bags of gasoline. Gasoline, balloons, balloons, balloons of gasoline. gasoline. They'd have them hanging up, and as the fire would burn, they'd open up the gasoline. As you're going in, the gasoline would open up, and it would light up right in front of you, sometimes right on top of you. Another unbelievable thing that they have here is like when there is a fire in an occupied building, there'll be one floor that the uh, the apartment that is burning. And the floor below it or the floor above it, they'll be wind up, they'll be taking stuff out. They'll be, you know, looting places, oh, which is really unbelievable. And, like, we have no way of knowing who, who's the occupant, if it's their, their property that they're taking down or what, you know. So you let them go by. Then, like, ten minutes later, somebody comes up and says, my apartment was robbed. And you say, well, listen, lady, there isn't much we could do about it. You know, it's, uh, we've seen people coming out with televisions, but we don't know if they own them, you know. and. Everybody, and uh, even the people themselves have, you know, they've armed themselves with sticks and stuff and gone after these people, you know, that they know that they're, they're looting and stuff like this here, yeah, which is really unbelievable. It sounds like they're uh, setting up a apartment of fire just for the purpose of uh, looting and robbing. <laughs> The people of the South Bronx are mostly transient. Few have jobs, most exist on welfare payments from a city hall which often seems more interested in keeping the people quiet than providing work. The poverty isn't material. No one starves, they dress well, own television sets, refrigerators, often even cars. It's spiritual, the poverty of hope breeding apathy and violence. Beneath the apparently placid surface, the South Bronx is an urban jungle. Well, there's no way out for the people in the South Bronx. I mean, I see that. They're, they're transient people. They go from one block to another block to another block until they have a fire, until they're burglarized, until, until they can't meet the rent. And, uh, but, the, you know, it stays in that one, oh, about a two-mile diameter. And, uh, and there's no way out for them. And that's the, 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 the tragedy of it. You have to be concerned. And all of this stuff, of course, is reflected, manifested for us in terms of fire, uh, in terms of false alarms, in terms of fires in abandoned buildings, in terms of real fires and what, what I call real fires, uh, serious fires in, in occupied buildings where people die very easily and very quickly. Uh, and and uh, for the firemen in, in, in Engine 82 and Ladder 31, I mean, there's no chance of 
reducing the kind of work that we're doing or reducing the response that we're making to false alarms and to, to fires unless we do something about the conditions of the Bronx. So, you know, I'm looking at it from one hand as, as a human being, on the other hand as a fireman. And I, and I think we have, a, we have an obligation with both hands to, to try to do something about it. Eddie Montague is one of the few firemen to live in the Bronx to understand perhaps just how difficult escape is, even for the children. Show me how you play basketball. Show me how you play basketball. Show me how you play basketball. Come on. See that? Give a triple. Let's see you make a hook shot. Let's see you shoot the basketball. Come on. Shoot the basketball. See that? I know. <laughs> He's something too, huh? Mostly, the firemen of Battalion 27 are resented. Even though he's black, lives here, and risks his life for their lives and property, Eddie Montague finds he too is resented. Well, it's, uh, in, in this particular area, it seems to be a resentment towards the uh, uniform. The uniform seems to represent the establishment to some people, but then again, you can't say to all people, but it is here and it is prevalent where the uniform does turn a lot of people off. Do you find, in fact, that being black in a largely black and Puerto Rican neighborhood is a positive advantage ever? Well, uh, in, certain, in certain situations, it's an advantage. In certain situations, it's a disadvantage. Because as we were just saying, uh, you represent part of the, uh, some people feel that you represent part of the establishment. And consequently, some people feel that uh, you're not on their side because you're wearing a uniform when actually we're, we're civil service and we're out to do a service for the public, which is all the people of the city of New York. 2896 Westchester and Manor Avenue. Uh, first of all, units acknowledge and respond. 31, 10, 4. Get out, any two truck on the sheet. Get out, everybody go, get out. The firemen always hope that every call will be what they call the big one. A fire where there will be leaping flames, screaming people to be rescued, chances to demonstrate their expertise. The men may hope for the big fire, but usually it's trivial, a food on the stove fire or a small fire started deliberately. Did somebody start the fire, do you know? We, we did. Yeah? You see, uh, in your family? Yeah, it's my child. Okay. Oh, did you? You better tell me the truth. Did you start that fire down? You did. What? Why are you doing? The place was like this, so these other rooms have a phone. Yeah, that was around. when we didn't let up. Okay. All right. All right. Well, that's it. Okay. Uh, on your computer. Also, I don't want to go through the phone. Where's the dog? He ran out of the house. Yeah, the dog was open. We got up here. Mm. Half past 11, and for ladder 31, the 14th response since the shift began at 6. And this time, it is a major fire, in a market complex only a few hundred yards from the firehouse.
this was a serious enough fire for units from all over the Bronx to be called in. There were 39 appliances at this fire, including specialist units, a communication control vehicle and a fire department ambulance. Nearly a third of the 150 firemen needed treatment. Many were on sick leave for several days, although there were no serious injuries. Casualties in the fire department are high. Last year, three times as many firemen as policemen were killed on duty in New York. So proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming. The annual presentation of awards and medals for gallantry to the men of the New York Fire Department. For the men of Battalion 27 from the Big House, as they call their station, a very special day because they've won two medals, presented by the Mayor of New York, John Lindsay. It is because we as a people value human life that firefighters go willingly into burning buildings, defying every powerful basic instinct for personal safety and survival. Not everyone in our society can share the burden, the commitment, the brotherhood, and the satisfactions of firefighting, or have the special grief and honor which comes to the family of those who have made the ultimate sacrifice. But everyone can take pride and hope in the examples of courage, compassion, and commitment, which we honor and celebrate today. The Nair Traumat Society Franklin Delano Roosevelt Medal, donated by the Nair Traumat Society, is awarded to Fireman Charles P. McCarthy. Charlie McCarthy of Ladder 31 won his medal for saving life. too was awarded the medal for saving life. Perhaps the drama and risk so dryly described in the official citation can only be fully appreciated by other firemen. Dan, what exactly did you do to win this medal? Well, it was out on building inspection one day and uh, I spotted smoke and flame pouring out of a window in an, uh, a tenement. And I ran up there and I pulled the box and uh, the fire alarm box, yeah. And a few of the neighbors said there were, were kids trapped above the fire floor. So I went up, I passed the fire, and I saw there was smoke and flame over blowing out into the public hall. So I reached in and I slammed the door closed, right? And I went up upstairs and, of course, a woman and child unconscious on the floor above. I dragged them downstairs, put them below the fire, right? And then, and then, then they were screaming, there was a woman trapped in the apartment directly above the fire. So I went up there, and, and I could, could hear her screaming. And uh, I forced the door open, and I went in and dragged her out, and uh, dragged her, her downstairs, and she was extremely heavy, too, so, uh, so they had, uh, that's it. That's the entire rescue. You make it all sound very cool. Yeah, yeah well. part of the day's work. That's it. And then the fire companies came, and they put the fire out, and that was it. Did you have any safety gear with you? None. No. 
any work whatsoever. It must have been quite a decision to make there, to go into a burning building on your own. No, you don't think about it. It's done on strictly on impulse. You know, you see a fire, you just go. And uh, there's no thought about, about your, yourself and nothing. You, you know, they, they were screaming that there's people trapped upstairs and everything. And you just go. That's it. Well, you might just go. I don't think most people would. Well, that's what, what you're getting paid for, right? 